right, welcome back. This is unit 4.1, and this is on gases, and this is going to be chapter 14 in your book. All right, so before we talk about gases, we need to talk about uh, the kinetic molecular theory, and this is how gas particles um, act. There's four statements here that you need to know. Uh, the first statement says that a volume of gas particles can be assumed to be negligible relative to the space between them. So basically that's just saying that gas particles are unimaginably small, just tiny little specks compared to the massive distance between each particle of gas that's in a container. Number two, gas particles are in constant motion. They're constantly moving and colliding with the inside walls of their container. And that's the definition of pressure. So pressure is how often and how hard the particles hit the inside of the container. When they hit the inside of the container, they bounce off. It's kind of like the pool balls on a pool table. They'll bounce around in a straight line um, until they hit the inside of the container and then they'll bounce off. Number three, gas particles neither attract nor repel one another because there's such a huge distance between them um, that they don't attract or repel one another. And then the fourth statement is that the average kinetic energy of a gas sample is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas. And this is going to be in Kelvin. Okay, So make sure that you pause the video and write those four things down. That's very important, the kinetic molecular theory. All right, some properties of gases. Gases will expand to fill any space that's available to them. So if I have a gas that's trapped in, say, an Erlenmeyer flask with a stopper on it, if I were to pull the stopper off and release that gas, that gas is going to come out of the Erlenmeyer flask, and then it's going to increase the space between each gas particle until it fills up the volume of the room. Okay, so they spread out to fill their container. Most gases are colorless and odor odorless. That's most gases, not all. All gases have very low density, and that's compared to their liquid and solid forms very low density. All gases can be mixed to form a solution. Remember, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. A good example of that is air. So air is a combination of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. Uh, the volume of gases changes with the pressure and the temperature. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Only state of matter that is compressible. So gases are the only state of matter that you can compress into a smaller volume. And you see that all the time. We compress air into a tank or compress helium into a tank. Okay, you cannot do that with liquids or solids. And lastly, volume, temperature, and pressure are all interrelated for a particular mass of gas. All right, so volume, temperature, and pressure we just talked about are interrelated. Uh, for volume, gases are measured in the standard units of liters. Remember, there's a thousand milliliters in a liter, or one milliliter is equal to 10 to the negative third liters. And you'll usually see gas volumes expressed as liters or milliliters. And when using a volume of gas in a mathematical equation or a formula, you're going to see we're going to do that in just a moment. You have to convert that over to liters. It has to be in liters. And uh, so a conversion may be necessary if they give you the volume of milliliters. So before you plug it in and do any mathematical equations, it has to be in liters. Temperature, there's two temperature scales in chemistry. There's the Celsius and the Kelvin. And gases typically, uh, we talk about them at very low temperatures. And um, so when we use these mathematical relationships of gases, usually it's below zero degrees Celsius. And so you're getting into negative numbers. And to avoid using negative numbers in formulas, we had to remember, you know, if you multiply or divide a positive and a negative, just don't get into that. We uh, change all of the temperatures into the Kelvin scale because remember the Kelvin scale 
the lowest possible temperature is zero. So there's no negative numbers in the Kelvin scale. So we don't have to worry about, you know, the relationships between negative and positive numbers. And for pressure, uh, this is a unit we have not discussed yet in chemistry. Pressure is a force, which is a push or pull on one body or another. Uh, the pressure that's exerted on your body right now as you're watching this is known as atmospheric pressure. And air, just like all matter on Earth, is affected by gravity. So the air that's closest to the surface of the Earth is being pushed down on by air that's above it. And at sea level is where the maximum pressure is going to be felt. And this is what we call one atmosphere just to standardize it. Um, or uh, 760 millimeters of mercury, it used to be measured like that. Uh, so pressure, unlike other characteristics, is expressed in several standard units. Um, and their atmospheres, which is abbreviated as ATM, millimeters of mercury, which is mmHg, kilopascals, which is kPa, pounds per square inch. And that's the unit that we use to fill up our tires um, and our basketballs and footballs, things like that, PSI, and tor. Um, is just Tor. And we get Tor because in the early 1600s, um, Evangelista Torselli designed a way to measure the atmospheric pressure, the amount of pressure that air is pushing on you. And you see a little uh, diagram right here in this corner. What he did was he took this long tube that was sealed on one end and open on the other, and he marked off millimeters. Okay, he probably used a file to etch off uh, millimeter units on it. And then he filled this to the very top, this tube with mercury. And then he put his finger over the top and then he inverted it into a bowl of mercury and then removed his finger and then he braced this somehow probably with a ring stand. And he saw that as the pressure, atmospheric pressure increased, it pushed down on this mercury that's in the bowl and in turn pushed the mercury up inside this tube and he could measure it because he etched off those millimeters and then when the atmospheric pressure decreased this mercury in this tube went down so he uh, developed this device a primitive barometer um, and it used mercury so that's where they get mmhg right here millimeters of mercury because that's how much the mercury rises or falls within this tube all right, and right here you need to write these down. These are all the equivalents in each one of the units. So one atmosphere is equal to 760 mmHg. These are conversion factors, which is also equal to 760 tor, okay, in recognition of Evangelista Torselli. Uh, KPA kilopascals is 101.3 KPA. And then standard pressure in PSI is 14.7. So you're going to need those. So I'll go ahead and pause the video and make sure you have those written down in your notes. All right, so we're going to talk about the different gas laws. There's four different scientists that developed these gas laws that worked on gases. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is Boyle's law. Boyle's law is the relationship between volume and pressure, just the volume and pressure. And Boyle's law says at a constant temperature, the volume occupied by a fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. So what that really means is that if you take a plunger here and you have a gas uh, with a plunger here that takes up this much volume and it's at this pressure, when you pull back on that plunger to increase the volume, it's going to decrease the pressure because remember what pressure is, it's these particles hitting the inside of the container. So if it's going to have more room to move around, these particles are going to hit the inside of the container less often. So the pressure is going to go down. So pressure is a measure of how often and how hard they hit the inside of this container. So if there's less room to move around, of course, the pressure is going to be high. If there's more room to move around then the pressure is going to be low. So here's the equation for Boyle's law, and you need to make sure that you write this down in your notes. 
Um, and the ones and the twos here represent a before and an after situation or old and new. And each one of these problems that you're going to see, there's going to be a situation where you have it's before and then something's going to change and we have to calculate the new uh, variable after this is changed. Okay, so here's an example of a typical problem that you're going to see for Boy that represents Boyle's Law. Harrison's parents decide to go on a ski trip to Colorado for winter break. He decides to pack his favorite snack, nacho cheese Doritos. Harrison lives in Seattle, which is at sea level. When he arrives at Steamboat Springs and checks and they check into their cabin, he notices that the bag of Doritos is about to burst. It has expanded like a nacho cheese balloon. Inquisitive as Harrison is, he decides to Google how much air is trapped in a bag of Doritos when it's packaged at the Frito-Lay plant in Seattle. He finds out that it's about 1.24 liters. If the atmospheric pressure in Seattle is approximately 1.1 atmospheres and the atmospheric pressure in Steamboat Springs is 0 0.9 atmospheres, what is the volume inside the expanded bag of nacho cheese Doritos? All right, so what we're going to do is use the glues method to figure this out. So what we need to do first is go through here and we need to circle all of our givens. Okay, so let's see. Here is the setup for the problem. Okay, so he finds out that it's 1.24 liters in the bag when it's packaged. If the atmospheric pressure in Seattle is approximately 1.1 atmospheres um, and the pressure in Steamboat Springs is 0.79 atmospheres, what is the volume inside the bag of nacho cheese Doritos? All right, so think about this problem. Uh, let's list out what we have. So we have 1.24 liters, okay? And that's the liters when it's packaged in Seattle. So liters is a volume. And since this is the liters packaged in Seattle, that's the starting volume because that's where he bought the nacho cheese Doritos. Okay, so in Seattle, the atmospheric pressure is 1.1 atmospheres. Okay, so that's a pressure and that's its original pressure. And so when he gets to Steamboat Springs, the pressure goes down to 0 0.79 atmospheres. Okay, so that's going to be pressure two because that's the ending pressure. All right, and then what are we looking for? It says, what is the volume inside of the nacho cheese Doritos? And it's talking about the volume when they get to Steamboat Springs. So the question is, how much is the ending volume? So that's going to be the V2. All right, so what you're going to do on these problems is list out the variables that you have like this, and then you're going to write your equation. So this is P1. V1 is equal to P2, V2, all right? Now, what I like to do is I like to put a box around the variable that I'm solving for. And here we're solving for V2, so I like to put a box around that. Now, what that tells me is that that's locked in. You're not going to move that. That stays where it is. So in order to solve this, we have to get everything else on this side of the equal sign. So here we have P2, I'm sorry, P2, yeah, times V2. So we're multiplying here. So in order to move this P2 algebraically, we have to do the opposite function of multiplying, which is dividing. So if we divide both sides by P2, so what we do to one side, we have to do to the other side. We see that this P2 and this P2 cancel because what's on top can cancel what's on bottom of a fraction. So this is equal to 1. So now we have V2 is equal to this uh, variables right here. So <clears throat> all we have left to do now for this problem is to plug numbers in here and then do the math. But before we do that, we had to make sure that we have all of these in the correct units. 
right? So for pressure, it has to be one of those units that we talked about earlier. So either atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, tor, PSI, or KPA. And if we have two pressures, they have to be in the same pressure. All right, so here we have atmospheres, which is good, that's okay. As long as the other one is in the same unit. If one of these is in atmospheres and one is in KPA, you're gonna have to change one of them. It doesn't matter which one, but they have to be the same. So you're gonna have to do a separate conversion to get these to be the same, but these are already the same, so that's okay. Now, volume always, always must be expressed in liters. So the volume here is milliliters. We're going to have to convert this over to liters before we plug it in. All right. So because this is the first problem we're doing, everything is in the correct units. So now all you do is plug in. Now, since we've listed them out and we put them equal to the variable they are, it's easy to just look over here and find the number that corresponds to that and plug it in. So here we're going to have P1 is 1.1 atmospheres. Okay. V2, I'm sorry, V1 is 1.24 liters. Okay, and this is going to be over P2, which is 0 0.79 atmospheres. Okay, and that's going to be equal to our V2. Now, I just want to let you look at the units here. And the reason um, that I wrote down the units is to show you that here on this problem, remember what's on top can cancel what's on bottom. And again, that's why it's important that these be in the same unit so they can cancel. So we cancel out atmospheres here. So the only unit we have left is going to be liters, which is the volume. So we're going to get our answer in liters. And I'm not going to go through and do the math for you because you can put numbers in a calculator just as easily as I can. So I just want to make sure that you know the setup. All right, the next law is Charles law, and this is the relationship between volume and temperature. And Charles law says that at a constant pressure, the volume occupied by a fixed mass of gas is directly proportional to its temperature. And here is the equation for that. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. All right, Jacques Charles was the second person ever to leave the Earth's surface in a hot air balloon, and King Louis XVI was so impressed by this that he gave Jacques Charles his own uh, science lab in Sorbonne. Sorbonne is a one of the oldest universities that there is, and it's located in Paris, France. All right, so here's another example problem. Let me switch back to my red. Harrison purchased a bag of nacho cheese Doritos at a nearby store in Steamboat Springs. He loves nacho cheese Doritos. He left them in the car as they went skiing the first day. It was a nice sunny day on the slopes. When they returned to the car that afternoon, Harrison noticed that his Dorito bag was once again inflated like a nacho cheese balloon. After some research, he discovered Charles Gas Law. The bag once again originally had a volume of 1.24 liters and the temperature inside the car when they arrived at the slopes that morning was zero degrees celsius while in the sun the temperature inside the car increased to about 85 degrees celsius what was the new volume of air in the bag all right so we have um let's list out our givens so 1.24 liters again was the original volume that was inside the bag um zero degrees celsius was the temperature that morning when they went skiing so that's the original temperature but when they returned to their car it was about 85 degrees celsius so that's the t2 that's the new temperature so what is the new volume inside the bag. So if this is the old volume. The new volume is going to be our V2. And that's what we're calculating. 
All right, so V1, T1 is equal to V2, T2. All right, and we're looking for V2. So I'm going to put a box around that because I don't want to move it. So I need to get rid of T2. So what function are we doing here? Dividing. So the opposite of dividing is multiplying. So I'm going to put T2 on top of both of these. So if you notice, what happens is if it's down here, I'm going to pop it up to the top on this side. Okay. So that means that if we multiply by T2, these two cancel out, and we've got V2 is equal to T2, V1 over T1. Now, I want to bring this up real quick because on these, if you're trying to calculate temperature, and I'm just going to write it over here and then I'll erase it. So if we have V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, if our question asks us to calculate temperature, so I'm going to log temperature down, and I need to divide by V2 on both sides to get rid of it. Okay, so V2 is going to cancel. I'm going to have 1 over T1. I'm sorry, T2 here. 1 over T2. That's the inverse of T2. So that's not what I want to solve for. So if you're ever solving for temperature, you have to do one additional step, and that's to flip both sides. So this is going to be, if I flip this, this is going to be V2 T1 over V1. Okay, and if I flip this, now it's going to be T2 over 1, which is just T2. So if you ever get a problem where you're solving for temperatures, make sure that you do that one additional step and flip both sides so you're solving for T2 instead of 1 over T2. Okay. All right, I just want to bring that up because I know that sometimes that can be tricky. But that's not what we're doing here. All right, we're solving for V2 over 1 or just V2. So now we have to come back and we have to make sure all of our variables are in the correct unit. Or for volume, liters is good. For temperature, we have Celsius. Now remember I said we cannot use Celsius. We have to use Kelvin. So let's think back to the beginning of the year when I was talking to you about Kelvin temperatures. And I told you the conversion for Kelvin. It's plus or minus 273. So if you're going from Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273. If you're going from Kelvin to Celsius, you subtract 273. All right, so we're going to have to convert this to Kelvin. So this is going to be 273 Kelvin. All right, and 85 degrees Celsius, we're going to add 273 to that. So if you take 85 plus 273, you're going to get 358. So 358 Kelvin here. All right, so now we have all of the units we need. So we're going to plug these into the appropriate place and solve for V2. So T2 is going to be 358. V1 is going to be 1.24 liters. And T1 is going to be 273. So if we're dividing Kelvin, divided by Kelvin, the Kelvins cancel out, just leaving your answer in liters. And since you're solving for a volume, you should get liters. All right. All right. Well, the next law is Gilusac's law. And this is uh, given to us by Joseph Gilusac. And this is the relationship between pressure and temperature. Gilusac's law says that a constant volume as the temperature increases, the pressure also increases. Okay, now Charles was having so much fun hot air ballooning that he never published his work. So Guy Lussac repeated Charles' work and published his results. And he was also a hot air balloon enthusiast. And in 1804, he ascended to a height of seven kilometers in a hydrogen-filled balloon. And this set a record which was unbroken for 50 years. There is a movie on Amazon Prime um, about this, and let me see if I can look that up. I don't remember the name right off the top of my head. Oh, the Aeronauts. Yes, it's the Aeronauts. 
if you want to watch that, it's an okay movie. It's not great, but it's about a hydrogen. It's about loosely based on Guy Lussac's life. Um, and he, they go up in a hot air balloon, he and another person. Um, and it's just, you know, their adventures. I'm not going to give away the movie, but it's called the aeronauts. If you want to watch that on Amazon prime. All right. So our example problem, Harrison also had a can of soda in the car when he got back from the slopes and he was so thirsty. He couldn't wait to get back to the cabin and get some ice. So he decided to drink the warm soda in the car. When he pulled the pop top, soda spewed everywhere in the car, all over his parents and his prissy 17 year old sister as she was touching up her makeup. I didn't even shake the can. I don't know what happened. All right. If the soda was at a pressure of one atmosphere, and a normal room temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. What was the pressure when the car reached the temperature of 85 degrees Celsius? Okay. So the formula for this is P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. And this is Guy Lussac's law. All right. So I'm going to write one atmosphere. Okay. And that's when it was canned. So that's going to be P1, the original atmospheric pressure. And at 23 degrees Celsius, that's the temperature inside the car. So that's T1 at the beginning of the day. And then the car heated up to 85 degrees Celsius. Now remember, this is Celsius, not the F word. So 85 degrees sounds like it's hot, but it's really not. All right, and so that's going to be our T2. And the question is asking, what is the new pressure that the can reached? Okay, so question mark um, is the new pressure that the can reached. All right, so P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. Okay, and so we're solving for P2, so I'll lock that down. So I'm getting rid of T2, so it's going to pop up here, cancel it here. So now look and make sure you're in all the correct units. We're not. We have 23 degrees Celsius here, and we have to be in Kelvin. So 23 plus 273 is going to be 296 Kelvin. Okay, and again, 85 degrees plus the 273 is going to be 358 Kelvin. All right, and atmospheres is a good pressure that we can use. So we're going to start plugging in. So T2 is 358 Kelvin. Okay, we're going to multiply that by P1, which is one atmosphere. Okay, over. T1, which is 296 Kelvin. Okay, Kelvins are going to cancel, leaving your uh, atmosphere as the unit for your answer. All right, and so you can calculate that and find out what pressure it was under. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is pay attention in class when your teacher goes over gas laws because spewing sticky soda all over your 17 year old sister is not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. All right. So if we take all of these and we combine all of these laws, now remember, we've already talked about Avogadro's law, which deals with the number of moles and pressure the number of moles of gas in a certain, I'm sorry, I said pressure, I meant volume. So if we take all of this that we know and combine it into one formula, you're going to get what's called the combined gas laws. And the way you use this is we can use this combined gas law instead of the individual laws. So if this is the only one you remember, that's going to be okay. Because if we're solving a problem and it doesn't contain moles and it doesn't contain any temperatures, we don't have to use this part of this equation. So we mark it out. And so we have P1V1 is equal to P2V2. That's Boyle's law. Okay. 
And if we have a equation where we don't have pressure and we don't have moles, so we're going to mark those out. That's V1 T1 over V2 T2. That's Charles law. See, so you're going to get the individual laws. So that's what I call this combined gas law. Now, what you do need to know is that P1 V1 is Boyle's law and V1 T1 V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. You're going to need to remember that that's Charles law. Okay. But if you just remember one equation, the combined gas law, you can use this for any of your gas problems. All right. So here's an example. Harrison's next day of skiing led to a big toe sprain on the rope toe at the bunny hill. Harrison was required to spend 24 hours in the infirmary under observation. He passes the time creating and solving gas law problems that he is to come to love. The economy size of Axe deodorant, which is 325 milliliters, contains a propellant inert gas at 445 kPa and at 12 degrees Celsius. What volume would this propellant gas occupy? That's going to be V2 because we're changing some things. So V2 in milliliters, if it were allowed to escape into a 101.3 kPa atmosphere at 21 degrees Celsius back home. All right, so let's list these out. So we have 325 milliliters, and that's when it was canned. So that's going to be a volume one at 445 kPa. Okay, and that's going to be P1 because that's its original pressure when it was canned at 12 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's going to be T1. What is this new volume? Okay, so that's V2. If it were allowed to escape at 101.3 kPa, oops, kPa, okay, and that's going to be a pressure 2 at 21 degrees Celsius, which is going to be the V2. I'm sorry, T2. All right, so here we have all of our variables and we're looking for V2. So let's write down, we don't have moles. Okay, so I don't, I can scratch that out because this has no reference to moles. So we have P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. And we're solving for V2. So I'm gonna put a box around V2. To get rid of T2, I'm going to multiply both sides by T2, so it's going to pop up to the top. To get rid of P2, I'm going to divide both sides by P2, so this is going to go down to the bottom. So now I have V2 is equal to this. All right, so I need to check my units, milliliters. I can't have milliliters. It has to be in liters. So if I convert this, I'm going to move the decimal point three times to the left, so it's going to be 0.325 liters. And if you don't know how to do that, then I suggest you take the 325 milliliters and you do the full conversion. So you want to get rid of milliliters, change it to liters. So this is 10 to the negative 3 liters is 1 milliliter because milli means 10 to the negative 3. And remember, you always put that in front of your base unit. So 3.25 times 10 to the negative 3 milliliters cancels you're going to get 0.325. Okay, so here we have KPA, KPA, those are good pressures. 12 degrees Celsius, we can't have Celsius, so we need to change that over to um, Kelvin. So 273 plus 12 is going to be 285. Okay, and then this 21, 273 plus 21 is going to be 294. Okay, so that's going to be our 
T2. So now we have everything in the correct units. We can just plug this in and solve for V2. So our volume is going to be in liters. Okay, and again, you can plug in numbers just like I can to get the answer on this. And that's going to give you the liters um, when this is all said and done. Okay, <clears throat> so the last equation here is the ideal gas laws. And this is the relationship between moles, pressure, volume, and temperature. There's not a before and after situation on the ideal gas law. It's just you have a gas at these conditions. What is the temperature? You have a gas at these conditions. What is the pressure? So you don't have to deal with the P1 on P2. It's just a gas at certain conditions. And this is called the ideal gas law because all gases use the same equation when they're at ideal conditions. And what is an ideal condition? It's high temperature and low pressure. And the reason for this is because it's away from its liquid gas phase change. So if you lower the pressure, I'm sorry, if you lower the temperature of a gas, it starts moving slower. Okay, and so let's say we have this gas particle that's moving in this direction and this gas particle moving in this direction. When they move slow enough, it could, once they get close here, cause them to, to stick together. And if they stick together, then that precipitates out as a liquid. Okay, so at low temperatures, when they're moving slower, that could happen. <clears throat> excuse me, and at low, uh, at high pressures. So if we pressurize this, remember, pressure is how often they hit the sides of the container. So if this is your container here, if we pressurize it and we get it down to this, then they're going to be hitting the same amount of gas. They're going to be hitting the sides of the container more often, and they're also going to be closer to each other. This distance between it is going to get smaller. So again, it can make them touch and then uh, precipitate out as a liquid. So ideal conditions are at high temperatures and low pressure. Non-ideal is at low temperature, high pressure when it's getting to its phase change. Okay. So as long as we stay away from its phase change, gases act, you can use this equation to solve for <clears throat> the missing variable in gases. All right, so pressure again, we have um, P, V is volume, N, remember, is moles, R. R here is the ideal gas constant, and we have that over here, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. And T is going to represent the temperature. Okay, and again, this is pressure in liters, I'm sorry, pressure in one of our given pressures, volumes in liters, moles, and temperature, again, has to be in Kelvin. So nothing's changing here as far as the units are concerned. But for pressure, I'm sorry, for the ideal gas constant, we have three different numbers that we have to choose from. And the units for these are liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin, or this one's liters KPA over moles Kelvin, or liters MMHG over moles Kelvin. So how do you know which one of these numbers to use in this formula? What you're going to do is look at the unit for pressure. Okay, That's the key. So if the pressure is in atmospheres, you're going to look for the unit in atmospheres, and you're going to use this numerical value for R. If your pressure is in KPA, you're going to look right here, see it's in KPA. You'll use this numerical value for R. And if your pressure is given in MMHG, then you're going to use this numerical value because the unit is MMHG. So you have to look at the unit that the pressure is in. All right, so if it's given to you in TOR, that's okay because TOR is the same value numerically as MMHG, so we'll just use this one. And it's given to you in PSI, then you're going to have to convert PSI over to either atmospheres, KPA, or MMHG 
And then whatever you convert it over to, you'll use the number that corresponds to that unit. Okay, so an example problem here says that uh, a 1.45 liter container is filled with sulfur dioxide, okay, and sulfur dioxide, O2, di sulfur dioxide, so that's SO2, at a pressure of 115.0 kPa and a temperature of 28 degrees Celsius. Okay, how many moles of sulfur dioxide gas are in the container? So we have PV is equal to NRT. Oops, let's list out our givens. I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. 1.45 liters, okay, that's going to be a volume. 115.0 kPa, okay, that's going to be a pressure. And then 28 degrees Celsius. You know what? I know I'm going to have to convert that to Kelvin. So I'm not even going to write down the Celsius temperature. I'm just going to go ahead and do that right now. So 28 degrees plus 273. It's going to be 301. So I'm just going to write 301 Kelvin is going to be my temperature. Okay, and it's asking how many moles. So it's going to be my N. Now my R, which is my gas constant, I'm going to look at my pressure. It's in kPa. So I'm going to use 8.31. And I don't have enough room to write all the units, but those are the units right here that I'm going to use. All right, so pressure, volume is equal to NRT. PV is equal to NRT. And this is called PIVNERT. PIVNERT. Okay, PIV, PV, NERT, NRT, PIVNERT. So sometimes I'll say the PIVNERT equation. Okay, and that just helps you remember what's equal to what. All right, so here we're solving for moles. So I'm going to lock this down, and I have to get rid of RT. So I'm going to divide both sides by RT. So I have PV over RT is equal to moles. So now I make sure I have all of these in the correct units. And I do, so all I have to do is plug in. So for pressure, it's going to be 115.0 okay, times volume, which is going to be 1.45 liters over, I'm sorry, this is kPa, over R, which is 8.31. And I'm going to write the units here. So that's liters times kPa over moles times Kelvin. Okay. And then temperature is going to be 301K. All right, so let's look at what cancels. So K cancels K. KPA cancels KPA. Liters cancels liters. So we have moles left. Now, you may think this is one over moles, but it's not because we're dividing here. We have to invert and multiply. So that's going to put moles on top when we invert. Okay, so we're going to get moles as our uh, answer for this. And so we just multiply this out and we get a number. Okay, that's equal to so many moles. Part B says calculate the mass of sulfur dioxide in this container. Okay, so we're going to start with the number of moles. So let me erase PivNerd here so I can have room to write. So whatever the answer is for this is moles, right? So that's what we're going to start with. Okay, and then it says calculate the mass. Well, we want to get rid of moles and we want to calculate the mass. Grams per mole. You remember what the unit is, grams per mole? molar mass. So you have to take the molar mass of SO2. Remember, it's just S and two O's. And you add up this. That's going to go here, the molar mass. It's one mole. Okay, so moles is going to end up being canceled. And then you're going to multiply this out, and you're going to get grams as your answer for part B. Okay?
All right, well, that is it for the ideal gas laws uh, and the combination gas law and the individual gas laws notes. So make sure you slap that like button right across the face. Give me a thumbs up and a like. And if you leave me a comment and you're not trolling me, I'll post your comment.